Okay, we're, we're on. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for dialing in. Uh, as, as you may know, uh, we host, we being Redeem Investments, uh, hosts um, something called the Redeem Team Mastermind uh, MAGS, which is a monthly accountability group session. It's our monthly webinar uh, in which we feature um, a keynote speaker or someone who is a expert who is an expert in their space and so today we have the honor of having my good friend mark allen who's the executive managing director uh, for Greystone investment sales group uh, who'll be talking to us today about dissecting an offering memorandum <clears throat> and so for anyone who is looking for uh, commercial real estate or uh, is seeking to invest with uh, a sponsor for an investment like you know, uh, real estate acquisitions and things of that nature. Knowing how to look at those things as a limited partner from the, from an investor's point of view is going to be very, very important. So that's uh, that's what we have lined up for you today. So welcome on to everybody who has joined us here. Please do uh, uh, pose any questions that you have in the chat feature. Um, I will ask Mark those questions as well as others that I will be asking him along the way. Uh, if it's something that he can or should answer in the moment, you know, I'll ask him to do that, or or we may wait to the end to do that. But please, um, please do submit those questions in, so that way we can uh, ask those of Mark. Uh, Corey, welcome on. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Like I said, um, a couple of things before we go in. I, I try to keep these to just an hour. I recognize, you know, Saturday mornings are your personal time, and so we'll we'll keep it to that. Um, as you may or may not know. After this call, for those who are members of the mastermind already, we break off and have uh, an additional call, and, and, and that one is again, it's members only. Where we uh, talk a little bit more in depth about the topic that was discussed, and talk about deals that are going on and where the, what the status of those deals are. And so it's really it's just a, a way for us to continue on with our morning session. Um, let me jump in on the slides. Bear with me, guys. All right, Mark, can you see my slides? I can. Okay, give me one second. Why is it going to the end here? All right, we'll do this. Okay, so uh, real quick, I want to. Uh, I'll spend the first uh, ten to fifteen minutes uh, just to give an overview of. Redeem Investments, uh, provide some announcements that are of things that are coming up, share a little bit about the mastermind for those that are interested in that, and then we'll get into the topic. We'll talk about that for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll reserve the last 15 minutes for, for Q&A um, to dig a little bit deeper into the topic. So uh, Redeem Investments is the name of my company. Uh, we do a couple of different things. Primarily, though, we focus on acquiring uh, multifamily, so value add multifamily assets, so commercial real estate, uh, where we can force appreciation, uh, return value to investors, and continue to hold properties over the long term. Um, we do also have something called the concierge services, which via a partnership that we have, um, that I'll talk about here a little bit more, we're able to provide some additional ancillary services that our tenants in our communities uh, typically would need to source on their own anyway, including telecom services, energy, et cetera. And then, of course, we have the Redeem Team Mastermind, which I just referenced, where uh, with the house within that 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 uh, space is where we offer uh, effectively coaching, mentoring, resources, um, anything that, that someone would need in order to get started uh, down the path of becoming a, a real estate syndicator, uh, sponsor for these types of investments. And then Redeem Realty Solutions, really is how we got started in real estate investing. That's focused on residential real estate stuff. Uh, it's sort of great out there because there's not a lot of activity that we do in that space. We, we did do one uh, fix and flip deal earlier this year, uh, but that's that's really not our area of focus. It's really on commercial real estate at this point. One thing that's super exciting for us that that I'm, I'm glad to share with this group is that we will, in the next couple of weeks, be launching a real estate investment fund um, and and really the purpose behind that is to enable us to uh, raise capital prior to identifying 
um, opportunities so that when we do, we can act and move on it very quickly. I think Mark will tell you that it's a highly competitive landscape. And so if those funds are available and ready to go and, and can be deployed readily, then it's just a matter of sourcing uh, the right type of uh, debt structure in order to take those deals down, as opposed to finding a deal, worrying about raising the capital, and whether we'll be able to do that successfully uh, in time for closing. And so uh, it allows us the scalability factor that I'm, I'm looking for and that a lot of our investors are looking for as we look at bigger and bigger deals. So very excited about that. M more to come on that uh, as we move forward here. Uh, I, I want to talk real quickly about the wealth formula. You know, oftentimes I'm, I, I talk about uh, this notion of, of creating wealth. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that I, I really like about Mark is, is just having some shared values around uh, ideologies with, with the purpose behind wealth creation. Really, it's not so much about trying to have uh, material wealth and fancy things or anything like that. It's more around being able to influence <clears throat> and pursue our passions and contribute to those causes that we care more, most deeply about. And so, you know, for me, for example, I, 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 uh, some of you may know I was born uh, in the Philippines and came to the United States at the age of uh, six. And uh, so I know and lived in poverty, you know, throughout that duration of time prior to coming to the U.S. And so I know what that life is like. And part of what drives me is, is this desire to want to go and help as many folks there in, in those conditions as possible. Uh, and so that's really part of my why. But starting off looking at the wealth formula, really it's the base of it is, is finding ways to make money. For the majority of us, that, that means having a W-2 employer or employment uh, that, that we use as the means by which we make money. Uh, if we do that consistently, if we do that well, then you know you really have to worry about then about uh, how do you keep that money, how do you safeguard it, and um, that's when things like budgets and personal uh, finance and things like that come into play. But then I think, arguably, most importantly, you know, taxes being uh, the single largest expense within uh, either a business, uh, whether it's a business or your personal uh, finances are concerned. Um, try to mitigate those taxes in order to uh, ensure that you're keeping more of the money that you're earning. And then lastly, finding different ways to multiply that money so that the velocity of it can increase. And that's where investments like the ones that we're looking at really come into play. And so, um, you know, so, so, so thinking about what we then offer, really it's, it's these items here, accelerated asymmetrical returns, finding properties where uh, it's lower risk than other types of investments, but because it's backed by uh, a real property or a real tangible asset, it tends to lower the risk um, and can produce higher returns. Um, access to income producing assets, uh, there's certainly tax advantages simply by way of how the tax code is written. Uh, welcome on, Justin, by the way. Um, but the way the tax code is written, there are tax advantages that are afforded to property owners. Um, and so we intend to take advantage of those and pass those on to our investors. The concierge service distribution, as I mentioned earlier, things like uh, internet services, cable, um, uh, utilities, uh, energy, a lot of those things we're now able to provide to our tenants in the communities that we own simply because we have this partnership with uh, an organization called ACN that allows us to do that as opposed to those tenants sourcing those um, services uh, on their own, which they can be aware it's very well do, but within uh, our uh, program, we get to share in that revenue and provide them with discounted services most of the time as well. Uh, joint venture partnerships. So these last two are really key features of the mastermind that that, um, that we've made available simply because people have asked how to go about doing what we've started to do. Uh, and so part of the way, and, and really one of my passions is to be able to give back uh, to the community and to others. There have been so many people who have helped me. Uh, and so part of the way that I'm trying to do that is to be make resources and knowledge and um, um, different people access to people like mark available so that they can continue to learn continue to grow and be able to do these things independently or to join forces with me in order to do exactly what i'm doing at a larger scale so um those who might be asking how can i participate in all of that uh of course you know if you simply want to learn more go to our website there's a lot of information there about who we are what we do 
assets that we currently have. Uh, information about the mastermind is there as well. If, if uh, folks are interested in investing with us, go to this uh, email or send a message to this email address, invest at redeeminvestments.com, um, and we'll set up time to talk. Uh, and then for those who are interested in joining our mastermind, uh, go to our website. There's a mastermind uh, page there, and that's where you can sign up. Um, a little bit about the mastermind. Effectively, when it's all said and done, it's a joint venture partnership program is really what it comes down to. Uh, because um, for those, again, who are aspiring to be a general partner in a real estate investment or a sponsor, uh, I'm making that opportunity available to come alongside me as the primary general partner in these deals so that people can uh, gain that experience, get that exposure, and, and be able to utilize that as part of their uh, background and experience when they are, you know, potentially seeking uh, debt for uh, a real estate transaction that they might do on their own, for example, or simply to be along for the ride and, and allow me to do what I do and and just participate and uh, be rewarded for for their contributions. It, it, it is not for everyone. Uh, those who are only interested in in being a limited partner, that's fine. We have opportunities for that, and so um, welcome that as well. But for those who are interested in the mastermind, uh, definitely uh, go to the website. The the other thing that I'll say is that you know obviously it's, it has to be limited because one of the key features is, is unlimited one on one time with me, and so there's only so much that I can uh, provide in that. Um, given that Thanksgiving is right around the corner and and uh, Black Friday, uh, I am doing the highest discount promotion that we've ever done, and I'll make that available to uh, the first five people. Uh, who register uh, by the end of Friday, 11th, 27th. So the promo code for that is Black Friday. Uh, but I do want to make that available for those who might be interested in doing that. Um, at any rate, let me transition now to, uh, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, let me tell you about some upcoming events that uh, is happening. I'm excited about where actually the semi-annual retreat that's part of the mastermind is coming up here in a couple of weeks. So my family and I are going to Cancun, uh, and so in the future, we'll make that available for those who are part of Mastermind as well. The MAGS session scheduled for December will feature uh, the SEC attorney that we work with. Uh, the meetup, so this is important, the meetup that we do on a quarterly basis will actually take place uh, in Dallas. Um, we would do a property tour of the newly renovated property that we have there, uh, which is right across the street from, Dallas, from Cowboy Stadium. Uh, and then we'll do a dinner and a watch party and I'll put, I'll put on a master class uh, during that time. And so for those who want to participate in that, please reach out to me as well. Um, the January MAG session will be on the 9th of January. Uh, February will be on the 13th. And then the next mastermind will be either in February or March. And then um, uh, and the MAG session for March will be on the 13th. And then be the next uh, retreat will be during spring break um, during the week of the 14th of March. So enough of the announcements. Let's get to the main event, which is uh, Mark Allen. I'm so excited to have Mark on uh, over the course of, I think, the past year now. I think we've uh, we've, we've learned more about each other and, and have grown in our friendship. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to doing some deals together here soon. Uh, Mark, as I mentioned, is with Greystone right now. Uh, he, he is sort of a super, not even a shooting star, a rising star, uh, really uh, in, in the DFW space where he's transacted or has been part of transacting, I think, over 3,000 uh, plus units uh, in 2018. He was a broker of the year, uh, been promoted multiple times in that space, and now has really become renowned uh, in that market for being one of the leaders in this space. And so uh, we're, 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 we're glad to have him on board here. He happens to be a fellow West Point graduate and a fellow Red Leg, uh, which is a field artillery uh, officer, and i um, really excited to have him on board. And so, Mark, without further ado, let me, let me hand it over to you so that way you can take us through the topic today. Welcome on. Yeah, Christian, thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks, everyone, for taking the time to join today. Um, like Christian said, I, I am cut from the same cloth. We both went to West Point and um, uh, made the connection, like you said, about a little over a year ago. So um, in incredible to see what uh, Christian has done. And I think he's taken an awesome route um, to get where he is today and look forward to seeing the continued growth and 
helping to um, uh, uh, create generational uh, wealth and um, help uh, people pursue their why. So today we're going to talk about, I wanted to really get into uh, the offering memorandum and whether you're a limited partner, a joint venture partner, or general partner sponsor of a deal, I think it's important to note the main components of an offering memorandum. So we're going to go through those today and I'm going to uh, pull up one of our uh, recent offering memorandums that uh, was a deal that actually Christian took a look at as well. It's not too far from uh, one of his current investments um, there in Arlington, Texas, right by AT&T Cowboy Stadium. Hey, uh, hey, hey Mark, I'm sorry, let, me, let me interrupt real quick, and, I, and I'm sorry to do this, but before you, you sort of jump into looking at the OM, you know, can you take a moment just to provide an overview of what you're seeing in the marketplace, maybe the impact of, of the recession and COVID on commercial real estate, if any, and then specifically with, with multifamily. If you don't mind doing that before you jump into the OM specifically, that way it sort of lays the foundation and gives people some insight into what's going on in the space. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think across the nation, we're, we're kind of seeing the same thing uh, for the most part. I think you have some of these uh, really, really what we call like pr the, the true primary markets across the country uh, that are really international MSAs with uh, New York City, San Francisco, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, uh, kind of a flight to the suburbs. But um, all in all, multifamily is, is kind of the poster child as as uh, we look, you know, I guess it's been nine months since uh, the stay in place orders um, on a federal level back in, in March or early April. Um, so, you know, looking at multifamily as a whole, it seems like everyone was concerned as, as the pandemic hit and everything started to shut down. Um, there was a lot of property managers that were like, we, you know, telling their clients or, or even owner operators that were really concerned about rent collections because, hey, if, if people are getting laid off from jobs, how are they going to pay the rent? Um, and I think uh, what we saw was the government stepped in very quickly, just, you know, um, ca uh, capitalizing on probably some lesson learned from uh, the last, the Great Recession, um, almost, you know, call it 10 years ago, uh, 10 plus years ago. And uh, they, they stepped in and, and helped obviously stimulate the economy with the CARES Act um, and provide uh, funding sources for a lot of those people in need and, and businesses in need. Um, so it, it seemed like as we went through April and then everyone was concerned, like, all right, well, a April collections, all right, what, what are, but I'm really concerned about May. And then, and then May was, you know, strong, I think, overall collected across the country, somewhere around, you know, 95%, which comparing year over year wasn't that much different. Um, so it seemed like right after May, at least for us, we put out one of our first listings because everything you know, at that time, there was this current concern about what the market uh, would hold for multifamily. So a lot of deals were taken off the market um, and uh, everything was kind of put on pause for those couple of months. So we ended up putting our first deal out in, in May and uh, within a three week period, it was um, a smaller property it was 50 uh, 56 units, it was 1980s construction. And I think a three week period, we had uh, 23 tours, despite being only a couple of months, um, you know, I'll just call it post pandemic. And uh, we had, I think 17 offers in total in a, in a three week period. So what we found is there's not much supply at that point um, early in the summer, but there was, there was a ton of pent up demand. And uh, uh, there's, you know, still a ton of capital um, that was raised, you know, prior, um, whether it be institutional or kind of middle market uh, private equity capital that was raised prior to the pandemic. And yeah, people just frankly, you know, have, have uh, a lot of liquidity and, and needed to put that capital to work. So, um, you know, today, I, I think really the last three months uh, on the sales side, it's been no different. We've seen a lot of properties that were pulled off the market, come back to market in Q3. Um, trying to trying to get the properties out kind of, you know, at least from our perspective before the election, because there's always this uncertainty going into the election, who's going to hold the presidential seat, who's going to hold the Senate um, and how will that affect real estate? So we typically see a pullback traditionally looking at years past on election years. And um, I mean, it, it, what we had is, you know, through I think early in the summer, everyone was looking for a discount for the most part. Um, but, you know, we still had probably 20% of the buyers that were willing to take the risk based on what they saw 
over the last couple of months with regard to rent collections and delinquency um, to, to, you know, put their best foot forward and, you know, really, and I would say, you know, pay market prices versus any kind of COVID discount, which was the term, sure. um, you know, five to 10% price. So I know, I know I'm going on, but anyways, we've seen incredible demand. I mean, more so than ever uh, from both coasts here in Texas, because I think, you know, that the, 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 um, the, the predominantly blue states um, and some of those investors in those states, they're just tired of the government control. Um, you know, for example, rent, rent control in, in areas like California, Seattle or New York. And uh, they want to come down to the Sun Belt, to the, to the southeast and in Texas in particular. Um, so we're, we're getting calls almost on a daily basis from new investors who, um, you know, own a sizable portfolio in, in various markets across the country. And, and they're looking to get into Texas, specifically Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, just because we have an incredible, diverse uh, economic base, um, you know, as far as technology, oil and gas, medical, so on and so forth. And it seems like almost, you know, almost every week still there's a new announcement in the news of a company that wants to move their headquarters here or expand um, their presence here in Dallas, Fort Worth. So, I mean, it's it's an incredible time to um, to own multifamily. And I'd say specifically in Texas and more specifically in Dallas, Fort Worth. Got it. Man, thanks for that context. That's that's really helpful. It's so interesting because, uh, you know, obviously um, you stand to benefit from all of the uh, activity and all of those things, uh, as, as would I. And so, you know, we're both sort of cheering this thing on. Obviously, from my standpoint, as a as a potential you know buyer, it, it makes it's, it makes for a more competitive landscape. Um, but uh you know, finding good deals and working with folks like yourself in order to do to do that, so that we can uh, identify deals that fit our criteria is is, is certainly one of the things that we uh, is an ongoing effort for us. So, uh, as you as you transition to looking at the OM, maybe putting on your investor hat, you know, what what is it that you like most in general about the multifamily asset class? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, as I mentioned before, it's it's been kind of the golden child post pandemic, I think uh, multifamily and probably a close second industrial. Um, but everyone needs a place to live at the end of the day. And um, so it, I think that coupled with the affordability crisis right now, it's just like prices of homes are going through the roof and it's much more affordable uh, to rent versus own. Um, I think also flexibility with uh, lease structure compared to commercial leases. I mean, you know, tenants are typically on on annual leases and you have the opportunity to grow rents over over that uh, short amount of time first. You know, maybe you're, you're stuck in a lease for five, seven, 10 years on a commercial lease and you have already pre-negotiated rates, um, usually maybe with 50 cent bumps or something like that. So I think those are some of the big things. The other thing I would probably say is financing. Financing is most attractive out of all the asset classes for multifamily. Specifically, uh, kind of the poster child is the agency lenders, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they provide some of the, uh, the the most attractive loans in the market, non-recourse, very low interest rates, interest only payments for a few years, 30 year amortization and uh, a, a, a flexible variety of different term lengths. So, Got it. OK. All right. Let me let me allow you to get into the, the OM. OK. All right, let's see. Let me pull this up here. Now you should be able to uh, share your screen as well. Yeah. There you go. Go to full screen mode. All right, so at any time, if you need me to zoom in, Christian, feel free to uh, let me know, or if you want to stop and ask a question, happy to answer those. Okay. Um, yeah, same goes to everyone else on the line. If you do have questions as, as uh, Mark is going along, please submit those. And, I'll, I'll triage them and and, uh, and then ask what uh, what is appropriate at the time. Yeah. So um, looking at our team right now, we really focus on workforce housing, which is your B and C class multifamily. And for those that don't know, um, I would kind of generally characterize B and C class multifamily in Texas as your your call it 1950s to um, 1980s construction, maybe maybe 90s as well. 
Um, so that's really what my team focuses on, although we're trying to build out more of a uh, institutional quality property team, which is like 2000s and newer. Um, so a lot of our offerings you'll see are very similar to Sawyer's Mill, which are 1960s, 70s and 80s construction, uh, which is the bulk of the inventory um, and DFW. So um, let's get into this. So this is Sawyer's Mill. And um, uh, typically at, on an offering memorandum, you'll, you'll see some basic components, which I'm going to go through. Um, it, here is the table of contents contents which provides the um, uh, components here so you'll see more of a property level analysis looking at general property details um, you also you'll see the investment highlights um, amenities and map and then uh, typically you'll have the financial overview which is the financial analysis we show on these type of properties a five-year cash flow or income analysis um, and then the, the rent comparables and sales comparables is a common component um, and very important. And then finally, you'll see more information on uh, the location, specifically uh, the market and the submarket. Uh, now, every broker uh, or brokerage is going to have probably a little different offering memorandum. And, and I think generally you'll have these same components, although they may be structured and uh, maybe at the beginning or end. And, uh, whatnot. So here uh, you, you can see you always have the contact of the broker and some of the uh, uh, support. We have our capital markets team. Greystone is, uh, has been a lender for 30 plus years and is one of the fastest growing uh, private desk lenders providing uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans um, along with HUD loans. Um, you know, on that note, Mark, uh, uh, someone asked a question uh, that says later, would you would love to hear a little bit more about the Freddie or Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac financing, how, yeah. how to get started with that and how you've seen them utilized in the past. Uh, and actually, I can I can speak to that a little bit as well uh, once you provide your answer, but maybe just spend a couple of minutes on that. Um, any any specific regarding multifamily um, or F Freddie Mac? I know I hit on some of the general terms. Yeah, I think the question is about, you know, how to get if someone let's let's assume someone was looking to purchase a, a multifamily property and they wanted to utilize, you know, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. What, what are some of the typical requirements or things that they ought to know as far as sourcing, uh, you know, those as lending sources? Yeah. So I, I would say generally you're going to have to meet certain net worth and liquidity requirements. Um, and that's why, you know, real estate is really a team sport. So. Yeah. Um, in my space specifically, call it this five to twenty million dollar purchase price um, range. It, we have more private syndicators or boutique syndicators that are raising equity from um, their network, family and friends. And uh, so you, you often see, you know, three, four, five, six plus uh, person sponsorship teams that uh, team together, all sign on the loan to to hit those net worth and liquidity requirements. And uh, usually the net worth amount is equal to the loan amount. Um, so if it's a $10 million loan, you need a $10 million net worth. But like I said, you can team together um, to, to be able to qualify for that loan. Uh, yeah, Mark. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep, keep going. No, if you have something to say on it. Well, I, what I was going to say is that, I mean, I, I love the fact that you just said that because it really is the genesis of this mastermind that I, I created for everybody is because I recognize that if I was going to grow and scale in this space that I, I needed to bring other people onto the team because I, I began looking at deals as I realized that the, the, there's a certain deal size that begins to make the most sense when you're talking about the cost of operating a property and how you wanna to try to gain efficiencies over the course of time. And really the, the size of the deal begins to matter even more. However, you know, the, the loan sizes of these deals were three, four, five million dollars. And as Mark indicated, uh, one of the requirements for these uh, lending sources, the agencies uh, and other you know, loan sources as well, life insurance and other things is to have a net worth amount that's equivalent to the size of the loan, which I did not. Uh, and so I brought on partners uh, that could then co-sign alongside me in order to take down those deals. Within the, within the um, context of the mastermind, those folks who were members in that 
also have the opportunity to participate as loan sponsors and be part of the sponsorship team uh, to that end so that we can we, we together can qualify to take down those bigger deals. Yeah. Another big, another main item is uh, experience level too. Um, I mean, they, they're really, the agencies are scrutinizing uh, the deal and the sponsor more so than ever. So, I mean, they look at um, how many, how many Fannie Mae loans, if you're going for a Fannie Mae loan, has the borrower um, had in the past or how many Freddie Mac loans? Uh, are they in state or out of state? Are they, are they local to the market? You know, that's a factor as well that that hurts or helps um, an investor. So if you're from California and getting you're a first time borrower in Texas, um, they're going to ding you a little bit on that. Uh, and then and then also, you know, I, I talked about net worth and liquidity. But um, if you have a really high net worth, let's say 100 million and you're trying to get a 10 million dollar loan and, you, and maybe you have you know five million liquid. Um, w well, you're, I mean, they underwrite the, the borrower. And uh, that's going to be a very strong borrower. So uh, they're probably going to get more preferred or better pricing um, too. So th those are just some aspects. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, that's, that's good. Thanks for that question, by the way. Yeah. Um, so back to the offering memorandum, you'll see here just kind of the offering procedures, what you would submit. Uh, typically, we look for a letter of intent, a resume. Uh, transaction references, if you have a, a broker that you've worked with in the past or maybe a seller that had a very good experience with you, those are helpful uh, if you haven't transacted with a broker in the past. Any banking references or um, information about uh, the lender, maybe it's a lender you know, uh, letter saying, hey, uh, th this borrower qualifies for uh, this property and loan amount. Um, and then any, any information on the source of the equity. And if you're raising the equity, uh, again, I mentioned that the largest buyer pool for uh, the properties that I sell are, are boutique syndicators. And, uh, you know, a lot of them don't have the three to seven million dollar down payment uh, when, when purchasing the property. They're going to raise that equity. But even if it's, uh, you know, you, you relay that source and have uh, some proof of funds maybe for the um uh, the earnest money deposit or something like that, that's helpful. Um, and, and then it just goes through regular you know, terms. This is offered on an all cash basis. So meaning that you can get a new loan on the property. Uh, you'll see that on the terms here. Um, some, some may be loan assumptions where, hey, in order to buy the property, um, it, you're likely going to have to assume the loan because of a large prepayment penalty. Um, Property tour, you know, just, hey, don't don't contact the on-site management. Just go through the broker. Um, and and uh, another common thing is the offer due date. So at least in today's market, uh, the typical marketing process is 30 to 45 days uh, where the broker will, will market the property and then it'll be set with a call for offers date. Here we have all offers due by October 28th. And, um, and, and the key dates here, tours, you know, are by appointment only. So sometimes there will be tour dates like, hey, that we're only touring on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, we'll coordinate then. So anyways, any questions there? No, nope, we're good. All right. So I'm just going to go through this chronologically. Um, as a, I'm a passive investor as well, a limited partner in deals. And um, I, I think it's, you know, uh, probably at least for me, number one is is the sponsor um, their, their level of experience and, and do we have similar values? Um, and do I, do I know, like, and trust that person? Uh, but number two would be the market. So I really look at both, uh, the market as a whole, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Houston, but also specifically, uh, the sub market There's some metrics that, that I look at, I'll go into later. Um, but I'm going to start here at the property analysis. So, um, I think it's, you know, you can get some really good information from the property details. And, and uh, I always recommend reading, reading through these property details and the offering memorandum. I, it's so annoying as a broker to have uh, buyers that don't read through the offering memorandum and ask questions that <laughs> could be answered uh, directly here in the offering memorandum. So there's a lot of good information here. And I would take the time, we, we, we you know, taking the time and resources to put these together. So definitely, uh, do that. But um, here, typically, you'll see 
the investment highlights, and I, I mean, really just going through these. A lot of a lot of times we'll highlight the location um, specific, like, hey, this is right off Cooper Street, which is right adjacent from the Arlington Memorial Hospital. Um, so there's going to be you know plenty of jobs, stable jobs at that. Um, it's also about two miles away from General Motors. Uh, AT and T Stadium is about a mile away along with Globe Life Park. So there's a lot going on in this area. Um, this property was owned for 29 years and uh, it, he's, you know, we note that there's poor oversight of operations. So it's really mismanaged. Uh, he's the pr property owner is not a property manager by trade. Uh, so there's a, there's uh, uh, quite a bit of opportunity for the ownership. Um, and, and then we typically, I, I'm not gonna go through all these, but um, you know, how much money was invested in the property um, you'll see things like, um, you know, maybe some value add uh, opportunity. And uh, here we always put if it's if it's a loan assumption off from free and clear. Right now, it's very attractive to uh, to to uh, get a new loan on a property just because interest rates are around for the agency loans around three percent. And, um, you know, there's properties that are put out to market that are loan assumptions on, you know, four and a half to five percent interest rates that were originated a couple of years ago. And uh, most investors want to be able to get a new loan with, uh, you know, a, a fresh term of interest only for two, three, you know, five years, whatever the case may be. So you'll see the investment highlights, uh, property details, some things of note. I, I won't go through all of these, but um, I'll tell you what most investors are, are looking for, what they like. And, and just because I say, for example, that investors uh, tend to shy away from chiller properties. Um, that, that doesn't mean that those are bad investments. Um, you know, th there's a lot of opportunity and, you know, any kind of property, but some, some investors just, uh, for example, with a chill water system, uh, some shy away from that because it, it's, it's more of a class C property because that chill water system controls the air conditioning for all the units. So if that goes down, that single unit, then your tenants are all without air conditioning. Um, but the individual HVAC um, on, on the opposite hand gives the tenants control. And obviously if the individual HVAC goes down, well, all the tenants don't lose uh, heat and air, just that one tenant. So I think you know that's a preference. But um, anyways, I mean, we always go through how many units. In this case, it's a two phase property that uh, two adjacent parcels and phase one's a little bit different because it's master metered, which means it's commercial electric and uh, uh, the tenants pay, the tenants could or cannot pay the property owner. Um, the other side is individually metered, which is just like your house uh, where you pay an electric provider. So that's important to know. We always, obviously the price, we price this offering at 13 million. Uh, the tax rate is important to know the foundation, whether it's concrete slab or if, or if it's pier and beam, some investors, um, you know, concrete slab, if there's plumbing issues on these old properties or sewer, sewer line breakage, then you've got to break into the slab. Um, you know, what, what is the roof composition? Is it is it a flat uh, TPO or is it a pitch shingle roof? And when was it replaced? So anyways, some more information that a lot of people want to know, because a roof can be a big capital item if you need to replace it. So how old is the roof? Um, uh, another thing, again, we went through kind of HVAC, uh, again, phase one, phase two. So different sides of the property. Have, this has central chiller system versus individual and uh, individually metered for electric on phase two. So some differences there. Another big thing is the wiring. If it's copper or aluminum wiring, uh, the lenders and the insurance providers don't like uh, aluminum wiring. Um, so if it's aluminum, you'll likely have to spend money to, to pigtail the wires is what they call it, um, which uh, it isn't all that expensive, but it's something that you need to calculate in your capital expenditures. Um, the fees and deposits are just typical fees. I mean, an investor could look at this and say, well, their pet deposit is, you know, uh, under market. I, I typically see 300. So that may be an additional revenue source that we could capture. Um, utilities and who pays them is, is very common. Uh, the personnel, how many staff are running the property is very important because if they're overstaffed, that may be an efficiency. 
and then how much is the staff paid or um, you know obviously whenever you take over a property you'll interview the staff and uh, see if it's worth uh, keeping them on if they're if they're worth you know what they're getting paid um, and then parking is another important one uh, surface whether it's asphalt or concrete investors like concrete because uh, it's less maintenance intensive so you know if you have a concrete parking lot there's a good chance you're not having to do much work on it um, if at all but asphalt needs to be repaved um, probably every you know I'm going to say four to five years potentially and that's that gets expensive any questions there yeah no well I, first of all thanks for getting uh, going through these things because I think it's it's helpful as I look at and evaluate different properties these these answer a lot of the questions that I, I would ask you know one, one of the things that as I mentioned earlier that we provide uh, in order to try to get some additional income uh, is you know energy services for example so uh, with electric so if I see that these are already individually metered and currently paid by the tenants that tells me that they're accustomed to that format which means that I could then provide be, be the provider of those energy services for them um, and and provide them uh, typically with a discounted rate but then uh, have a revenue share that comes back to the property um, additionally, like you said, other aspects of this would be an indication of what may need to be addressed as far as the roof. Uh, think things that from an operational cost standpoint, um, we want to know and, and sort of plan for uh, so we can include that in our analysis for future you know, operational performance and, and things of that nature. So uh, definitely good stuff on this page. Yeah. Um, and ROM, the next page would be the value creation highlights. And this is very important because as an investor, you, you want to know, well, how do I how do I boost the NOI and how do I make um, create value at this property so I can either refinance and return equity to my investors or potentially sell at a higher price down the road, uh, which is the traditional um, you know, syndicator model, a three to five year hold where you're you're coming in at a certain purchase price. You're, you're putting money into the property, increasing the income, decreasing the expenses, which obviously boosts the value of the property. Uh, so this is really important. And as a broker, uh, we try to identify uh, what are the value creation strategies. Um, so here, the ownership has proven out upside on 54 units that he's upgraded out of the 134. So. He's capturing, depending on the unit size, at $225 to $350 delta uh, per unit um, on those renovations. So that's a big, that's usually the biggest one. Most investors want to be able to push rents first, maybe add ancillary uh, revenue line items because, um, you know, you, you, you can, uh, well, I mean, depending on the market, there's, <coughs> if a market swings in the opposite direction, obviously there may be concession on the rents, but some of the, some of the reserve parking and uh, you know even maybe rubs income and some of these charges that we're we're capturing now will will likely uh, go away. So I think that's important. Um, in this case, there's a unit conversion opportunity. He's got some some just uh, like a, a non revenue producing units that are sitting idle. So bringing those up online uh, to to get an annual increase of about seventy three thousand uh, dollars of income. That's very important. There is some other income strategies here from uh, implementing reserve parking, which is common, maybe uh, charging additional rent for the, the, the units that have backyard fences, uh, capturing a, a pet rent or higher pet deposit, some of those items. And then uh, it, it rubs collection. So rubs is ratio utility billing uh, system. And basically what it is, if it is a, uh, uh, billing system to capture uh, the water and sewer expense or another utility expense. So if, if the property is paying for the water and sewer, uh, a lot of times they'll bill back the tenants to capture uh, some of that expense. So um, here he's he's underutilizing. In Texas, it's I think it's a law that you can tip, uh, go up to 80% of the water and sewer bill. And I think here he was only capturing 42%. So there's definitely additional income that could be could be captured. Um, and then there's a couple of items that aren't over here. So again, an, important to read through uh, the offering memorandum in full. Hey, Mark, the occupancy rate is, is listed here somewhere, right? The current occupancy? 
Um, let's see. Typically, um, if it is, it should be it should be here. But I, I know for sure it's in the in the financial analysis. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, we lay out amenities. Obviously, you'll have more pictures of the property to give you a sense of uh, of the pictures. I would say, as a broker, obviously, we have professional marketing teams that are uh, uh, actually this property in particular the landscaping is very lush the grass is actually in great shape and very green but uh they do enhance on these pictures sometimes just be advised i, I, I was going to ask uh, if any part of this was photoshopped <laughs> yeah they do photoshop some of these photos and not not materially but you know they'll make the grass more green if if it's a gray day outside they can you know make the sky blue sure um, and, and then we have the map, which is important to take a look at. So you can see here, here's the property, Sawyer's Mill. And then uh, we typically highlight the major employers in the area. Um, I, I don't like that now that I catch this, Texas uh, Memorial Hospital is right here and not highlighted, uh, but that's a, a main employer, you know, elementary schools, middle schools. We typically get the, 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 the assigned schools for the property. Um, some of the attractions such as AT&T Stadium, Six Flags is right here. You've got a, a Meadowbrook Golf Course, University of Texas of Arlington, and some of the some of the retailers that you find around here. I mean, here we have Whole Foods up here and Starbucks. So uh, generally, I think you want to see quality retail. You don't want to see you know uh, dollar stores or pawn shops um, all around. And I mean as, as that's an area we, we may get promotional. We, we don't like to highlight those if there are um, those retail around the property, but you'll want to do your diligence and, and see the quality of the retail and what kind of amenities or attractions are in the area. Uh, what What is the uh, the schools that are in the area? How are they rated? Maybe greatschools.org is a good resource. Um, you know, anything five, uh, five or above out of 10 is, is uh, you know, pretty good school, but obviously the higher, the better. Um, so those are some, some uh, important things to note here. Awesome. Um, some more, we have more pictures. This is the leasing office in here. So you can see it's kind of created a sense of community with these lights. There's music playing out here. Um, and then you can see the pictures of his interior upgrades, um, which, which vary, but, uh, you know, look pretty nice for the area. We have some aerial shots. I mean, here you see the property. You can see Cowboy or AT&T Stadium here. So um, just kind of highlight the area and the property. Um, and I'm not going to get into this so much, but we typically go into the financial analysis from here. We'll have the unit mix. So you can see the breakdown of uh, which unit types, bed, bath count. And this one, obviously, it's a little different with Phase two is over here. Phase one is here. So again, there were some differences between the two uh, buildings. So we had to highlight highlight that here because it changes the utility billing structure. Um, and then you can just kind of get a sense of how many units of each uh, unit type. What is the average rent in place today? What are they asking when a tenant comes into the property would be the market rent. And then what is the uh, you know, where, where can you take the rents in the future with, uh, you know, coming in, adding additional upgrades or, or sprucing up the community? Yeah, so on the topic of financials, uh, Mark, you know, obviously it's one thing to have that, that kind of summary, even this that you're showing now um, in the OM, but, you know, the, 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 the more sophisticated, uh, um, buyers and maybe just a standard buyer even should be and, and can request, you know, T12 financials and rent roll and things of that nature. So that way they can underwrite those because, uh, you know, some of these uh, images and some of these financials here may not fully capture what, what they would need to know and evaluate uh, when considering the purchase. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's fair to say. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I guess this is important, obviously, this is the five year income analysis, but like, you know, Christian was alluding to, it's the buyers going to underwrite um, their own income and expenses and, and uh, you know, they'll have experience either themselves operating the properties or, you know, will rely on the property manager who probably has, you know, a few thousand plus units under management and, and know what 
um, apartments in this area, for example, will cost to run uh, repairs and maintenance for the year um, or, you know, advertising promotions at the property, so on and so forth. Like, like advertising would be any marketing efforts, but also website creation for the property and things of that nature, hosting the website. So this just gives you an idea where where you can kind of see the, the um, NOI. I mean, I, the other thing it would be is like putting in your debt service. So how much is are your loan payments and then basically calculating your cash flow from here. Um, we, we typically don't don't do that. We just show our analysis uh, because a lot of our offerings are unpriced and at market prices. Uh, down here, we just have the additional income strategies. Uh, that would be other other revenue sources, such as I mentioned before, reserve parking, um, you know, month to month rent charges, things like that. And then, the, of course, the notes that kind of support or give you some information of how we came to our our pro forma amount. Um, all right. So the rent comparables are obviously really important. And. Um, you know, ideally, they're, the rent comparables are like the direct competition of the property. But um, I told Christian, I mean, we've talked about this, that some of the rent comparables are maybe not the best rent comparables. If you have, for example, Sawyer's Mill and adjacent to Sawyer's Mill, you have a rundown property, maybe that doesn't have a pool or some of the same amenities. It's probably not the best rent comparable. So you, you really do want to capture something um, and ideally in a in a, a one mile radius, uh, depending on the area. I mean, this could be a suburban location of Dallas, Fort Worth. Like uh, if anyone knows Waxahachie, Texas or Greenville, Texas, which is, you know, 45 minutes to an hour outside the city, um, you may need to stretch a little bit farther to capture those rent comparables because it's not dense. Um, so, so here we have some competing properties within a one mile radius, not on the other side of the highway um similar age um and you know upgrade package and and utility building and whatnot so anything to highlight here christian no i think um i think you i think you covered it i think for me it's always important to know uh, uh where is our the subject property how does it fare from a rent per square foot perspective versus the rent comparables because that gives me insight into you know what kind of rent growth I could I could truly have, assuming that these are good comparables uh, to to look at. You know what I mean? So that's that's part of part of our evaluation. Yeah, and on the other hand, I hear some investors that are less per square foot driven and more like like, hey, I'm I'm more rent. Like if they're all in right. it is a thousand dollars, but they're a little bit smaller units by a hundred square feet. Um, you know that this tenant base is not really looking at it like well hey it's a dollar 32 over here and a dollar you know 26 over here they're looking at what what is their total cost all in right um, and obviously what are what amenities do i do i have and how nice is the property some of those aspects mm -hmm. of course yeah um uh, so anyway so this breaks down by floor plan and you can see uh basically what what these surrounding units uh, based on each bedroom are charging to help you compare apples to apples and figure out where it, your rent should be based on the rent comparables. But you'll, you'll obviously have to do more diligence. I mean, we provide some unit amenity comparison as far as what's upgraded in the units. Um, I mean, if you're comparing it, um, obviously, if they have updated cabinet fronts and stainless steel appliances, um, you know, you'll want to to uh, um, uh, consider that when comparing your apples to apples approach. Also, we put the community amenities like how many pools do they have a club room or fitness center? Obviously, Sawyer's Mill does not have a club room or fitness center. So probably a little less comparable to unless you add it um, a, a Belmont. But for example, let's say Belmont has higher rents than the rest of the market. Well, maybe that's because they have a fitness center. Mm -hmm. so maybe that's maybe that's a value add opportunity that you uh, turn turn a, some of the space into a fitness center. So right. Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the next item would be sales comparables. And um, so it, this could be difficult, obviously, depending on the market. 
uh, a lack thereof. Texas is very difficult in general because we're a non-disclosure state. Uh, so, uh, you know, let's say Florida, for example, uh, Florida is a disclosure state, which means all sales prices are disclosed. Well, in Texas, um, not all sales prices are disclosed. So it's tough to gather this information. Um, in this case, we were trying to look for, um, you know, comparable properties as far as age uh, of the property, number of units and, and unit size is important. Um, but it's just, you know, there weren't as many sales comparables uh, here in this area around the property. So we had to stretch out a little bit. This is another area where I would say we were probably a little more promotional here. Um, there are some properties that have traded uh, in this general vicinity, um, uh, but but they have smaller units. Um, I, I didn't feel like they were all that direct comparables, but also the price per door was you know not very attractive compared to where we were selling the property because there, there's a property right up the road called Avalon and it had very small units. Um, and it traded for 70,000 a unit two years ago. So the sale date is very important too. You know, what? nothing is sold in 2020, uh, but we've had a drop in interest rates, almost 100, a full 1%. They went from four to 3%. So obviously that's going to help boost um, prices and values just because your, your cost of capital is lower. So, you know, ideally we have sale dates within the last six to 12 months. Um, but here, here we didn't uh, we didn't really have that as much. Couple here in late 2019, which is helpful. Anything there, Christian, on sales comps? No, I, I mean it, you're you're hitting you're hitting all the major topics. I think what you and I talked about before, you you, you pretty well covered in terms of you know proximity to the property and yeah. and whether whether these uh, properties are, are in fact uh, comparable yeah. to the subject one. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah, so sure, ideally you, you would really like to have a 1960s construction property for Sawyer's Mill that traded right in this area in the last six months, but uh, unfortunately we don't have that. Right. Um, so it's a little tougher to comp. Sure. Um, uh, what, what, one other question came in here, uh, Mark, and, and as I'm looking at the time, because of the number of questions and, and things like that, we'll probably go just a little bit over, so if you guys bear with us here. Um, but I want to make sure that you get all your questions answered. So next question is, do your buyers ask for these rent and sales comps over time to get an idea of appreciation over time or just more about current transactions and comps? Uh, yeah, that, that great question. Um, some buyers do ask for, they, they want to see uh, prices over, over a period of time. So I have had that. A lot of buyers will, um, if they don't have access to uh, themselves. Brokers have access to a variety of data and software, uh, data sources and software. Um, CoStar and Yardy Matrix are, are two large ones uh, for just general data and information. So, uh, and those those uh, platforms are very expensive. So, uh, I would say, I would suggest rely on your broker for those and ask them for a CoStar report for the property or a Yardy Matrix report for the property. And uh, they can provide that, which provides a lot of the same information, rent comps, sales comps, demographic information in, in a three mile radius, um, you know, so on and so forth. So th those are helpful and it can kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say, you know, weed through, but I mean, some brokers are promotional um, more so than others. And, you know, that gives you more raw facts versus the broker choosing and picking what they want to put in the offering memorandum to, to really kind of bolster the property and the value. Right. Good stuff. Um, so I'm not going to go into this too much, but I, location is key. Um, you know, investors, I would say, want to be in an area that has a median in, in, in Texas, that is a uh, household income of above 45,000. And if you get too low, it's like, how, you know, how are these tenants paying their, their seven, eight hundred dollar rents when they have car expense and food expense and all these other things. So um, this location in particular is gentrifying. There's a lot of development going on, a lot of investment, uh, which is highlighted here. So those are all important things. But um, you know, anyways, just provide a lot of information on the submarket in general and usually Dallas Fort Worth. And that's that's all I'll say about that. 
And here you can see just some of the employers in the area, education, um, you know, sports teams, population, all important data. And that would be that would be all for the offering memorandum. Those are the general components. Um, yeah. Go ahead and address any questions. No, no, that's good stuff, uh, Mark. Thanks for going through that. I mean, I've seen offering memorandums that are <laughs> tens and tens of pages long, uh, and some that are more sort of concise that gives you what you need. So it's there, there's sort of a broad range of yeah. uh, of what of what you can see in this. And so I, I appreciate you going through. This one is an example. Um, sort of as we as we land the plane uh, here on the session, Mark, maybe speak to uh, you know someone who wants to get started in in, in the commercial real estate game. What, what would your advice be on how they could or should start? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, very competitive market in Dallas Fort Worth, and I'm like, I see new bidders and buyers all the time that are that are relatively new to real estate. And uh, I just like, man, it's it's a tough market out there. It's very competitive. And I mean, the seller wants surety of clothes and, and, and you know, it's high risk to take a risk on a new buyer. So I always recommend either a smaller property at first. And I say smaller, like under 50 units where there's a little less competition and probably less sophistication. Uh, or secondary tertiary markets, a smaller market like uh, in Texas, we would have, you know, Waco, Wichita Falls, uh, Tyler Longview. So I think once you once you prove out the concept and uh, you close on a deal and have those references, that can help you break into a larger market. The other thing I would mention, you know, I I, I said that real estate is a team sport. Uh, so I truly believe in, in Christian and his mastermind model here. Uh, that's a great way to get your foot in the door, get experience. And uh, so kind of this mastermind slash uh, mentorship coaching type program is probably the other way um, to, to get your feet wet. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've also invested as a, as a limited partner in, uh, in you know, our fellow West Point uh, grad Jim Young uh, does a lot of real estate development uh, here uh, in, in Central Texas and around the state. And in order for me to learn sort of more about the development process, uh, I, I've, I've invested as a limited partner so I can get some exposure to how that process works. And so that's something else uh, to your point as far as getting engaged with someone who's actively doing it as a way to gain experience. Uh, so thanks for, for mentioning that. And then, and then lastly here, uh, Mark, any any Parting words of, of wisdom. How, how folks? How can folks get a hold of you? Uh, perhaps to to engage with you in, in some in some way or just to learn. Yeah. So uh, LinkedIn is a great way. I'm active on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to reach out to me, Mark Allen Greystone. Um, email would be another one, Mark Allen at GraystoneISG.com. And uh, Christian, feel free to put that in the the Q and A uh, box over there. Um, parting words of wisdom. I, I think, you know, what you're doing, Christian is, is awesome. I think it's, uh, I, I mean, I'm very passionate about real estate. I believe in multifamily over the long term, And, um, I, I would just say, you know, by, by right, it's kind of old at age, um, uh, investment, you know, philosophy, you make your, you make your, your, your money when you buy, I guess is true for any investment, whether it's stocks, bonds, or, or real estate. Um, so, you know, and like I mentioned, I think location is key buying. I don't think you can go wrong if you buy at a good basis, uh, quality property in, in a very good location, um, specifically that has some great traffic uh, going by. Um, so those those would be some, I guess, uh, parting words of wisdom. Fantastic. All right. Well, listen, I, I don't take for granted at all that you carving time out of your Saturday morning to join us. And so appreciate you doing that, Mark, really and truly, and, and for everyone else who uh, joined as well. Thank you for taking time to listen in. Um, please contact me should you have more questions. If you want to learn more, as I mentioned, go to uh, the resources that I pointed to earlier and uh, hoping to continue to scale and grow together. And, and uh, Mark, thank you again for, for uh, being part of this. So I appreciate you guys and uh, God bless. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Bye.